Okay. Mr. Chair, the room is ready when you are. Okay, thanks. Just a second here. Okay, well, welcome to the, uh, what is today, February, <laughs> February 8th <laughs> meeting of the uh, Affordable Housing Advisory Board. Uh, I think before we get started, someone from the staff has an announcement about Zoom meeting procedure. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Chair. This is Danny Walters with the Community Development Division, and uh, I'm just going to read the meeting procedure guidelines for everybody. Um, this meeting is being recorded and broadcast on the city's YouTube channel and public access cable 25. During the meeting, when you are not participating, please mute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon found on the lower left-hand side of the Zoom menu next to the video icon. When you are muted, a red line will appear over the icon. Muting your microphone during the meeting will make it easier for everyone to hear. You'll just have to remember to unmute it if and when you want to speak. In some cases, staff may mute or unmute people as needed just to minimize the distractions during the meeting. Please remember to state your name every time you speak for the benefit of those listening remotely. You can turn your video camera on or off by clicking the video icon in the menu. For the purpose of the public meeting, when you are participating in the meeting, please keep your video on. When you're not participating in the meeting, it's okay to turn your video off. You'll still be able to listen to the meeting when your video is off. You'll just need to remember to turn your video on if you are back on participating. In some cases, I may turn someone's video off if they are not actively participating to avoid distraction during the meeting. You can always turn your video back on during the meeting. If you're participating by phone, you can click star six to unmute your phone. For those using Zoom, somewhere on your screen, you will see a choice to toggle between speaker and gallery view. Speaker view shows the active speaker, gallery view tiles all the meeting participants. Board members and city staff members, you must state your name and title each time before you speak. All motions will need to be stated clearly. We will also be using a Word document to um, type out the motions as they're being done, just to avoid any confusion so everyone can, can see what we're looking at. Um, after a motion is made and seconded, the chair will call on board members individually to provide their vote. Mr. Chair, you will then need to announce whether the motion carried and the count of the vote. When public comment is sought on an item, individuals participating via Zoom should use the raise your hand feature. Windows and Mac users can access this feature through the participants button at the bottom of their screen. Android and iPhone users can access this feature through the more button located at the bottom right hand corner of their screen. For those calling in by phone, you may dial star nine. Individuals will be called upon by name in the order they appear on the meeting host screen. When you are called on, please unmute your listening device and state your name before speaking. The chair will then call for in-person public comment for those without access to technology options. Staff present will direct you to the podium to speak following social distancing and safety protocols. The regular three minute term lim time limit will apply. Thank you. Uh, Monty Sokup, Chair, thank you. Um, I think I want to make sure uh, I know who's here to start with. So I'm going to read off people that I see, um, board members in attendance. And if I don't call your name, please bring it to my attention. So I have Edith, uh, Shannon Reed, Christina Gentry, Rebecca Buford, Sarah Waters, Erica Zimmerman, Dana Ortiz, Ron Gaches, Thomas Howe and myself. Is there, did a, are there any board members present that I missed? Or is Cole at the city offices? Uh, Jeff Craig, Planning and Development Services. There are no members in the room present. There is no public in the room this afternoon either. Okay. 
Great, Ms. Monte Soka, Chair, thank you. Okay, so I think with that, we will open for public comment, just open public comment. Anybody? Okay, you all have to bear with me because I can't see everybody. If you raise your hand on the screen, I can't necessarily see you. So, because there's so many people um, to speak up. Mr. Chair, this is Diane Stoddard. I, I do not see anyone raising their hand in the raise hand feature or or on the video as I can see in it and appears as Jeff indicated, there's no one in the room um, at okay. City Hall either. Great, thank you, Diane. Uh, we will close the open public comment. The next thing on the agenda is to approve uh, the minutes from the January 11, 2021, they were included in the packet. Um, this Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve the minutes of the January meeting. Ron Gacious, Chamber Representative. Thomas Howe, uh, Lawrence Board of Realtors Representative, I would second that motion. Okay, so we have a motion and a second on the table. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Okay, seeing none, um, I will call uh, the present board members' names for vote. Please vote aye or yes if you're in favor of approving the motion. Edith Guffey. Yes. Shannon Reed. Yes. Christina Gentry. Uh, I wasn't present, so I would say nay. No. Rebecca Buford. I was not present, so I will abstain. Uh, Sarah Waters. Yes. Erica Zimmerman. Yes. Dana Ortiz. Yes. Ron Gacious. Yes. Thomas Howe. Yes. Monty Soka. Yes. So that is <laughs> six, eight, yes one nay and one abstention. Motion passes. Okay, so the next thing on our agenda um, is to welcome our newest member, Shannon Reed. Shannon, would you like to take just a second to uh, say a little about yourself? No pressure. <laughs> Sure, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> and also we'll take note uh, in the future that I, I was not at the last meeting, obviously. So um, we'll take note of that with minute approval. Um, so I am your new county commissioner for the second district of Douglas County and um, was really excited to um, join this board and um, Commissioner Kelly was gracious to um, to uh, motion for that a couple meetings ago. So excited to be here. I um, also work at the Willow Domestic Violence Center. I've been there for eight years um, doing the court advocacy program and supporting survivors with a whole host of things in the community, um, including housing barriers and um, housing safety issues and, and relocation. And um, I know I have a lot to learn. I know a lot about people's individual barriers um, in the community and hoping to uplift that and those voices um, and excited. I know I have a lot to learn. So excited to really understand the work you all have been doing and um, join the conversation. So thanks for having me. Monty Sokup Chair, thank you, Shannon. Uh, welcome aboard. Um, we all learn a lot, I think, in this committee and uh, through the research that our staff does for us. Um, for me, it's been very rewarding. So, um, okay, moving on to the uh, second item, the received the finan monthly financial report. 
Good morning, uh, Danielle Bushcutter, Budget and Strategic Initiatives Administrator. Um, this will be um, brief. For the month of January, we had revenues um, related to sales tax at a rate of seven, just over $76,000. Um, so that is um, right in line with, with what we had budgeted and um, were expecting. So I think that is some good news early on in the year. Um, the other thing that I wanna note, if you're looking at the actual report, um, there were some issues with the upload download process uh, that happened over the weekend uh, that we're still trying to sort through. So those expenditures um, aren't accurate in the report, but we have a meeting this afternoon to hopefully get those sorted. So I just wanted to make you all aware of that. Uh, the revenues do appear to be accurate, but we don't have any expenditures yet uh, for uh, 2021, even though we have some showing up on the report. So um, wanted to call that out to your attention as well, but we should get that sorted out here, um, hopefully by tomorrow. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do you have any questions from board members? Hey, Daniel, I have one question. The 76,000, that would have been, if I'm calculating correctly, like November's taxes? Yep, tax Daniel Bushcutter. Uh, that is correct. And the other thing that I um, should always say uh, at the beginning of the year is that the report that we show you is uh, cash basis. Um, when the city actually does their financials, we have a modified accrual basis. So um, that won't be the final number that we have in there uh, probably, you know, six, seven months from now. But um, Monty, you are correct. Those are for the sales tax proceeds that were spent in the month of November. The state did their processing in the month of December and we received them in January. Wonderful. Thank Monty Soga, Chair. Thank you. Is there Are there any other questions or discussion regarding the... Uh, source it, or the monthly financial report. Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to item three, source of income research memo developed by the staff. Do we have a staff report on that? I'll introduce okay. it, Mr. Chair, Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. So you'll recall that uh, this item was on your agenda back in um, 2020. And uh, when this um, was presented, the board indicated a desire to have a, uh, have some more detailed discussion on it, and you wanted that scheduled here at your February meeting. And additionally, uh, you were interested um, if the uh, city attorney um, who had drafted this memo could be available to answer any questions. And Maria Garcia, who is an assistant city attorney, is here uh, at the meeting today and uh, she's available to, um, uh, to either you know, recap the memo or answer any questions, whatever the board's desire is uh, for that. So I will turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair, for that. Uh, Monty Sokup, Chair, thank you, Diane. Um, I think before uh, we do anything else, I'm gonna ask if the, anybody from the committee had any questions regarding that memo. This is, this is Danny Walters uh, with Planning and Development Services. Just real quick, I also wanted to point out, we did receive an email from Christina a little bit ago, and uh, it had some additional links and some information regarding this topic. We went ahead and we attached it to your agenda items. So you will be able to, to look at that. Um, because it was so close to meeting time though, we didn't send out a notification, but um, it, it is there for your review. And Danielle, the yes. links were not live in, in the copy of Christina's email that you sent to us. In other words, I could not click through any of the information there. The links were not live. Apparently when you resent it, uh, it took the links out. Okay. Um, we, we will look into that. So, so sorry about that. Okay, well, Seeing no other comments, I, I'm going to dive in there a little bit. Um, I read through the uh, memo, and although I, you know, I think this is a worthy thing to look at, I'm wondering, as I read through that, looking at what appears to be the difficulty or challenges of trying to pursue something like this, um, it looks like we could invest a considerable amount of effort trying to put something like this in place. And before we did that, I guess I would ask the question if 
if we think that um, this is an issue that needs that kind of effort. And I'm not saying it's not, I just wanna make sure before we move forward and put a lot of effort into something that there's, um, it's not just a perceived issue or, and I, I guess I'd look to our people that work in that uh, realm, is this a big enough problem to put, you know, significant efforts into, to, uh, so I see some heads nodding, so I'm gonna have those people maybe comment on that. Mr. Chair, Thomas with the Lawrence Board of Realtors, if I could just say something prior to, to the comments from those involved. I am not directly um, uh, affected or, or involved in those things, but it strikes me that the way the memo was written said, well, it couldn't be something which was mandated, but if there were a way that the city could say, here is something which we think is important, we are paying attention to that, we think that source of income equity is a, is a valuable consideration uh, without necessarily putting a mandate in place. It felt to me like that memo said, yeah, we would be perilously close to trying to do a rent control, which is not legal. But if we were in fact to say, this is an issue of concern to us, we'd like it known that we are concerned and will be monitoring it and potentially looking at if there were a way to, I'm not gonna say circumvent, but work with that that rent control issue to work with it. Just my two cents. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, Ron's got it, Ron Gacious has uh, his hand up. Ron Gacious, Chamber of Commerce representative. I have a question for Maria that might bear on your, que on your question, uh, Monty, and that is, uh, Maria, don't cities have standing to ask the Kansas Attorney General's office to render an opinion, just an opinion letter, on whether something uh, they are considering to do would be uh, uh, legal in the state of Kansas or not? Uh, are, don't you have the ability to ask the Attorney General's office for an opinion, which would be a non-binding opinion because it wouldn't be a court opinion, it'd be an AG opinion. But could we get some guidance from the AG's office uh, about what are the parameters? You know, I, I, I read Tony's um, uh, memo also, I thought it was a great memo. Uh, mm -hmm. You probably wrote it for her. Uh, or, you know, I'm not sure whose signatures were on it, but can, can you do that with, with Derek Schmidt's office? Thank you for that question. Good morning, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I'm Maria Garcia, Assistant City Attorney. And yes, um, historically for, for many decades, cities have posed questions to the Kansas Attorney General for a legal opinion. Um, in recent years, um, those questions have been posed primarily by members of the legislature. And so I'm, I'm, I would have to check whether the Attorney General is only accepting questions um, for from those individuals or if they accept questions from city attorneys still. Um, I seem to remember there might have been a change recently, but I can certainly check that for you. But um, yes, many times questions are posed to the Attorney General. As you mentioned, they are not binding law. Um, the reason for the question questions that are posed is because there's not an existing statute on point or case law that's interpreting the question. And so the attorney general renders an advisory opinion that um, can be persuasive to cities um, and others in Kansas that have the question and maybe even perhaps in future litigation if it ever does come up in a, um, a Supreme Court decision, for example. But um, I guess the short answer to your question is, I think that is possible. I'd have to check who it has to come from, but those are exactly or precisely the types of questions that the Attorney General um, can consider. Uh, Thank you, Maria. Edith? Edith Guffey, member at large. Um, I, I assume this was on our agenda because it is a problem. Uh, people it people do experience some discrimination based on this. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about, I read that Governor Kelly has set up a task group to look at affordable housing uh, statewide. And I wonder uh, if we might bring this issue to their attention, if it's not already on their agenda and that we could approach it that way and wrap it into a bigger conversation that's gonna be taking place statewide about affordable housing issues. 
Monty Stoke up chair. Uh, Edith, I really like that idea. I think we can move this forward. That's at least one avenue we can move it forward, even if we uh, you know, decide to work on it locally as well. That certainly is something that could maybe, I don't know what that looks like, Diane, but maybe that's a memo from this board, you know, summarizing our desire to, or our need in our community for this and desire to have it pushed to a state level. Um, Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I'll uh, have a comment on that and maybe the previous question as well. I think that um, um, the appropriate thing, if, this, if the advisory board would wish to move forward with um, that communication to the state um, or requesting an attorney general's opinion, and as, as uh, Ms. Garcia pointed out, that, that may or may not be a, a possible avenue for cities anymore, but, um, but a, an appropriate course in, in my view would be for this board then to make that recommendation to the city commission for the city commission to authorize that on behalf of the city. So right. that in either case, it would be a communication um, from, from the city officially. Monty Sokup Chair, thank you, Diane, for that clarification. Um, I, I kind of like that idea as at least as a first step. Um, are there other comments on that or people would like to comment? Okay, I'm not seeing anybody raising their hand. So, um, Ann, what would we need? Do we need a, some kind of motion to do that or is that just a recommendation to, to forward? What do you yes. <laughs> Diane Sautter, Assistant City Manager. Mr. Chair, what I would recommend is that there would be a motion um, that would be the recommendation and, and um, um, wording that however the board desires, but the, the uh, recommendation would go to the City Commission for them to act in direct, um, you know, a formal communication uh, to, to the state um, on either of those points that the board wishes. Okay, Monty Sokup Chair, thank you, Diane. Um, I guess I am looking for a motion from the floor uh, to that nature. Okay, Dana? Uh, not yet a motion. Um, Dana oh. Ortiz, Family Promise of Lawrence, um, responding to what Edith said, I thought that's a very good um, path forward as an option. And it is a problem, as she as she noted. We put it on the agenda because it must be a problem. It is a problem um, of the families that we serve. Certainly, it is a problem, even voucher in hand with guaranteed income supplement or rent. It is a continuous problem. Um, and Shannon's not here today, but she sure could speak to it from a Lawrence Douglas County Housing Authority. Um, we frequently have to apply for additional time for families uh, to, in order to find a place because they have a certain period of time with each voucher to find a place that will rent to them. And frequently we have to apply for extensions for that. So it is an issue. Monty Sokup Chair, thank you, Dana. That is uh, good insight. So I am looking for a motion from the floor that summarizes a recommendation to our city commission for our desired outcome. And I think uh, Danielle would be typing that up on, right? We would type that up on the screen as when yes. we get there. Yes, okay. Jeff's actually gonna share his screen um, and type it, so. Yeah, so we can we can kind of wordsmith it a little bit so we get it right. You don't have to get it right the first time, so. Ron? Ron Gacious, Chamber Executive, uh, Chamber Representative. Uh, <laughs> Diane, could you, could you repeat the recommendation you had for us to consider? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. My, my comment was, that in the event that the board did wish to make a recommendation, um, as Ms. Guppy had, had suggested, 
uh, to the state, um, to the, the group that's working on affordable housing issues, you know, related to this matter, or you wish to um, submit a request, you know, to the Attorney General's office um, on this matter, my, my suggestion is that that recommendation come in the form of a motion from the board to the city commission um, to recommend that that communication be be formally transmitted from the city um, to the state. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Ron. Uh, Ron Gacious, uh, Chamber Representative. Uh, I'd like to make the motion that uh, the advisory board recommend to the city commission that they encourage the governor's task force on housing to examine and make recommendations on the issue of uh, income source discrimination. Jeff Craig, Planning and Development Services Director. Have the motion typed up. It just won't let me share the screen, unfortunately, at the moment. So give me one second to work that, that glitch out. <laughs> Diane Stoddard, Jeff, I think I can help with that. Hold on just a second. Let me. Walters with Planning and Development Services. Um, Diane, I can also help with that. I found the... Oh, thank you. I think I might have just had success with it. Okay. <laughs> Any otherwise, let's see if Jeff might be able to do it. Uh, Jeff Crick, Planning and Development Services. Not quite yet. It's still not happy with me. <laughs> I may have, if you could try it again there, Jeff. Oh, Jeff Craig Planning Development Services looks like it's going to work, so give me one second. Okay, great. I hit a button too, so probably between the two of us we got it. It's between the two of us, we were hitting lots of buttons. Thank you. Jeff Craig Planning and Development Services, I believe the motion is now uh, showing on the screens. Is the um, the tense in that a little odd? You mean to say the board recommends to the city commission that they encourage the state affordable housing task force to review income source discrimination? I don't understand how what this reviews income. Thank you. I'm. While I'm in favor of us doing this, I, I would be interested. I think that uh, Christina had some maybe stronger points in her email and in her conversation mm -hmm. around this than what we are doing here. And Christina, if you'd be willing, I'd really like to hear from your perspective uh, whether or not these actions that we're taking are, uh, are strong enough. Uh, as I'm reading, the board recommends that to the city commission that they that they encourage the state affordable housing task force to review income source discrimination. There, those, there's a lot of words there, 
right? And I don't think those words that we are talking about right there in that space really move to action. I think we're a recommending board and we do what we can to be a recommending board and advise. However, I know that you can recommend actions to happen, but you cannot make them happen in a way that's going to be actionable for the people who are experiencing discrimination due to their source of income. So I, I did place a couple of resources into our, our chat that made sense to me to, for us to examine in the space and, and talk about. And I would love to talk about those resources, but I want to examine a couple. Well, one, for example, that we know, for example, how housing vouchers have played a part in one, making sure that people get paid or housing and landlords get paid um, in a time of COVID, that it's not always going to happen if, if we don't have to address the um, barriers to getting affordable housing to be acceptable as it resumes itself or as it exists in uh, Section 8 or uh, HUD housing efforts. Like We can do all that we can do in trying to encourage people to accept vouchers, but what are we really going to do when it comes down to people accepting them? I just don't know what that looks like when speaking from experience. And so Christina Gentry, I'm here on the board as a person with lived experience with housing vouchers and housing assistance. I don't know what that looks like when um, a housing voucher is in hand and you give it to the landlord and they don't accept it in a way that makes you um, look like you're a viable source of income for them. Um, I think if anything, COVID has shown us that the inequities exist and they're exasperated with people who have lack of resources. And the people with lack of resources that are the viable incomes that you should put forth effort into. So if anything, the equity that has come forth with the, the, the COVID experience that we have all experienced um, has made me realize how oftentimes we view equity as a afterthought. And I really want to move in the space of creating um, goals, uh, source of income being an open opportunity for people to understand how housing could be equitable for them. Um, a lot of times they're, they're asking for three times the rent when you are trying to get into a property. And three times the rent is a lot of money to ask someone to try to rent a property that they're not even going to own. Um, so I would like for us, short story, long story, for us to examine how this can play a part into our affordable housing advisory board and what we can do to make this equitable for people who um, are gaining income that's not the standard uh, way of gaining income. And I'm, I'm talking about people who uh, are gaining income from, let's say, cash app and people who are working in, in industries that don't benefit um, the hierarchy of what the dominant culture wants to understand as, as a, a, a source of income. So you put me on the spot here, but I definitely can speak to this, this effort. And I really definitely want to make sure that our community wants um, to know that we're moving in a way that's equitable. And we're trying to make sure that anytime that we understand how money and funding is raised, that we are also moving that into an affordable housing opportunity. So, Christine, I, I did not intend to put you, I'm sorry, Thomas Howell, Board of Realtors representative. I, I certainly did not intend to put you on the spot. I, I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm very interested in your input into this topic. And perhaps at this point, 
really what we should do as an advisory board would be to craft a statement around this as a topic. Uh, I think if we make a motion right now, we're just kind of shuffling it to the side. And I think perhaps what we really should do in this particular topic, and this is different than what we normally cope with, but uh, I, I might suggest that we want to, we, we might want to make a statement, we might want to, um, I'm not sure it's a specific recommendation, but we should come up with a policy or a, uh, what am I trying to say, a statement on, on this topic. That's Go ahead, Dana. Thank you. I just want to follow up with what Christina shared some, and thank you, Christina, for speaking and raising the issue. Um, with this HSC collaborative that we worked on, Rebecca uh, Buford and I worked on, and the Chamber of Commerce, we ran into uh, a great deal of um, distrust initial, initially. Um, and with time, some of that lessened, but we, there's actually a landlord that refused to take a third party check, cash in hand. There were a couple who refused to take the money, period. Um, frequently, the Chamber of Commerce could get on the phone and speak business person to business person and, and reach an agreement, but, but this was us with a large pot of money and checks writing them on behalf of citizens who had suffered COVID lost income and couldn't make their rent. Checks and, and there was hesitation um, in a pandemic. I, I just think this is, is a critical problem. Christina talks about it being, it's outside of the pandemic, but right now when housing is such a critical component of healthcare, it's just showing us what is already broken and needs our attention. So I agree with Christina, a memo, I think could, we could recommend a memo be drafted, but we do have to have some definite action items. When there's cash in hand to give to a landlord and it comes outside of the particular household, but it's cash in hand, we should, we should, it, it's appalling to me that that's not accepted. Okay. Uh, this is Monty Stoke up chair. I think uh, I'm hearing some consensus around maybe before we make a recommendation that maybe we should, uh, I don't know, maybe we have staff draft a memo kind of stating the things that we're hearing and maybe some of our providers could help provide some details like Dana just provided or Christina provided uh, around that memo to put some flesh around the idea that we're making a recommendation that they follow up on this idea with uh, the state uh, entity that's studying it, but more than just a one-liner that says, look into this, which is kind of where we are right now. So I think we need some meat around that. Um, do you think we could uh, work on drafting that and maybe review the memo at the next meeting we have and then we can act on that memo go ahead diane i see you're trying to stop me <laughs> thanks M mr chair diane stoddard assistant city manager uh yes i think we uh could certainly do that it, um in uh seeing where the conversation is going my suggestion would be that we draft a letter and then um you all could review that at your next meeting and then you could have something tangible that you're recommending that uh, the, a, a particular letter um, be sent um, by by the city officially, and you can recommend that through the through the city commission. And that letter could have you know more more detail and facts and things that that you want to bring to uh, light. And we could certainly um, start that draft off for you. Um, one other thing that I did did want to mention, since several people are using the chat box, um, I didn't please ask everyone to not use the chat box in the open meeting that we're in. Um, when people are viewing that on YouTube, they cannot read comments on the chat box, so everyone will need to make their comment um, so that everybody can hear, uh, which is um, uh, verbally here. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Monty Sokup Chair. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Dana, I see you have your hand up. Thank you, Monty. Dana Ortiz, Family Promise of Lawrence. If that's the way the 
the board wants to go with a, a letter memo, I would be most happy to participate in that and serve with some reference materials through the CARES many in the HSC that we've been involved with recently. Uh, small Circuit sort of Chair, thank you, Dana. I see Erica. Erica Zimmerman, Lawrence Habitat. I also just wanted to mention, I know there are a couple other groups in the community that are working on this very issue as well. So maybe reaching out to some of those groups. I know they've done extensive research also and have really good information and background as well. So maybe um, reaching out to some of those groups to get the information they've found as well. Uh, Monty Sokup Chair, thank you, Erica. Um, Diane, I'm gonna ask uh, if Dana and Erica and others have information, when would they, when would be good time for you to get that, to give them somewhat of a deadline so that you guys have time to have something put together for our next meeting? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. Um, if, if folks would be able to get any info uh, to us in let's say one week, that would be helpful. We um, are in a position of posting your next agenda a week before that meeting uh, comes. So that will just give us plenty of time to get a draft together and so that it's posted for your packet. Monty Sokup Chair, thank you, Diane. Uh, does, does that work for every, anybody have a problem with that? I'll just go that way. <laughs> okay. So, um, we have a motion on the table with no second. I'm gonna uh, suggest that we drop that motion. Is there something we have to do to that? Ron? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ryan Gacious, Chamber Representative. I've with, I withdraw my motion. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Monty Sogup, Chair. Um, is there, are there any other comments on this topic before we move on? I think we have a plan to move forward. I see uh, Thomas. Yeah, just a quick comment. I, I am pleased that we are taking the step of uh, not just doing a Band-Aid on this. I think this is an important issue that really gets directly to uh, affordability, equity, to how do we make our community a better place for everyone. And so I'm strongly in support of our doing more work around this topic and not just trying to do something quickly. Thank you. Thanks to all the members. Monty Sokup Chair, thank you, Thomas. Uh, I agree, certainly agree with you. And it's unfortunate that uh, we don't have the power just to do this ourselves or have the city do some ordinance or something. And uh, it, it's, you know, certainly these are tough issues to deal with, like a lot of what we deal with. So that's why they call us advisory. <laughs> I guess, I guess you're right. Um, Okay, seeing no further comments, as I look, um, we will move on to number four, receive letter from Venice to homeowners regarding Libertad Lawrence, consider changes to funding allocations. Okay, so we received a letter uh, from Libertad basically indicating that although the project's moving forward, they don't need the funding in this Base, I'm summarizing basically in this round, uh, and that could become an allocation in the, the fall uh, NOFA, which essentially frees up uh, some of the funds um, that we could reallocate. And we had made in our minutes had approved a motion to recommend the city commission to move forward with several projects, even though there wasn't funding out of our uh, out of our pot of money. So at this point, if we uh, essentially rescind our recommendation for the Libertad project or defer it, whichever you'd like to call it, we would have then $450,000 to allocate to those other projects. So I, I think we need to do two things and certainly Diane, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think we need to do something about our current recommendation that we approved in the minutes for the $450,000 Libertad project. So we need to defer that or, um, or just stop it. I don't know which is best. Um, 
and then we need to decide what we want to do with that money that is freed up. So, uh, Thomas, I see you have your hand up. As did uh, Ron. Ron, I will uh, cede my time to you there. Uh, Ron? Ron, Ron Gacious, Chamber Representative. I had a question for Rebecca Buford regarding uh, the letter uh, of January 11th, just for uh, a couple of points of clarification. It is the intention, Rebecca, that if you can gain access to the adjacent piece of land, that the entire project will grow in size. And if that's the case, do you also anticipate that the request from the Housing Trust Fund will grow in size? Thank you. Rebecca Buford, tenants to homeowners. <laughs> Diane, did you have something? I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, uh, Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. I, I should have um, mentioned that those who do have conflicts with this item should recuse themselves um, from any of the discussion re related to this. Um, they may have representatives who might be able to answer the question on behalf of the application. Uh, but just as a reminder to those of you who may who may have conflicts of interest, um, you you should declare those and not participate in the in the meeting um, during this portion of the of the discussion, which would mean um, either leaving the meeting and resuming um, your participation um, toward the end, or you could just simply um, mute and turn your video off for this portion. Sorry, I didn't clarify that earlier. Uh Ron Gracious Chamber represent. I don't. I don't understand this request. Their application has been withdrawn by this letter, hasn't it? Is there is there still a conflict? Haven't they withdrawn their application for this funding cycle? Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. That 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 is correct. I I presume yes yes that's correct. Um, sorry about that. I. In, in thinking about that, I think that um, Ms. Buford could certainly answer that question, but I also did want to remind everyone else um, about um, recusing themselves if they have submitted an, an application. Okay, this is Monty Soak Up Chair. So I'm gonna just moving forward here, I wanna just clarify one thing. So we're gonna, what I wanna do here is basically accept, I want, I'd like to, um, have a motion to accept the uh, rescinding of their application, which I think everybody can be here for, I believe. And then when we move on to figuring out what we're going to do with the funding, then I think we'll have to have anybody that has a active proposal recuse themselves. Does that mm -hmm. sound right, Diane? Okay. Okay. Yes. So yeah. I would certainly open the floor to discussion and or accept a motion to accept the uh, rescinding or removal of uh, uh, their project from this round of funding. I, I'd like to move that we accept the uh, rescinding of it with a proviso that it's a deferral uh, and we will, uh, when this comes up again, we will certainly look on it in a similar light to how we've looked at it on this. Uh, yeah, Diane, the sponsor took up chair, Diane. Mr. Chair, Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. Um, I think I would encourage the board to be very clear whether you mean um, deferral in that um, you're deferring this application for discussion um, amongst other applications that you'll be discussing um, the next time you have a notice of funding availability or whether, um, whether this board is wanting to to designate um, funds for this project um, as as funded in that notice of funding availability for the fall, which does really commit those those dollars. So I just um, encourage the board to be um, be thoughtful about how you how you really wish to articulate that so that it's very clear. Monty Sogup Chair, uh, certainly open to ideas, but I think we simply 
pull this project from this round of funding. And I hate to commit funds to it, trying to be fair to all applicants, not knowing what other projects we might see. I think this is a superstar project, but I don't know what other superstar projects we might get in the next round of funding. So I, I think it's not fair to allocate funds to it at this point, not seeing the other projects it's competing against. That's just my opinion. So I guess I would, my recommendation would be that we um, remove it from this round of funding and certainly uh, tenants and homeowners can make an application in the next round uh, along with every other project. And again, I this is a superstar project, so I'm not, you know, so that's where I am. Uh, Rebecca, I see you have your hand up. Well, I, this does get tricky, I, and I guess Rebecca be for executive director. I I want to say I did not ask to defer funding. I asked to be removed so that this issue doesn't come up, and that I don't have to recuse myself from this discussion. I guess. I I mean, I guess I want to be very clear that we're not asking for you to commit funds in the future. We expect to resubmit our proposal and be very clear as to what we want to do with it in the future. And that way we can we can let you know what the project develops into more specifically, because within a year it will develop m much more. I don't expect to ask for more. I just expect to give you much more detail on what we're doing. I, ho the, uh, I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Thomas. Um, so I guess, unless there's further comment, I would uh, ask for a motion from the floor uh, to pull this project from the funding request in this round of the NOFA. So moved. This is Christina Gentry. Um, citizen at large, I would support that action. I also want us to think about how um, half of the board was in a position where they had to recuse themselves from the decisions that were made from um, the opportunity to push this grant out into the community. So I think this is probably a conversation we could have later on when we talk about the board's makeup. But I would love to have had Dana and Rebecca and other people chime in to this opportunity with our grant funds, but they couldn't because they were recused because they were going to benefit from these grant funds. So I, I really want us to try to dive into how our board's makeup also prohibits um, us from doing things in, in the community that would benefit the community when it comes to affordable housing efforts. Auntie Sokup Chair, thank you, Christina. I uh, have struggled with that <laughs> as well. Uh, when we have our four experts uh, in the community not able to participate, it certainly creates challenges uh, for us as a, as a board trying to function. And I don't know what the answer is, but um, I agree. Maybe we should look into that. Um, I think that may be an exploration with the staff um, outside the board meeting that could then maybe come with some kind of recommendation or finding if it is simply a finding of what, you know, like finding could be, we can do nothing, but, uh, maybe there's some different structure or something that could be, uh, could be used. I don't know on the board. Uh, so, um, I guess. I'm certainly willing to try to carry that forward, uh, working with Diane and others at the city and at least come up with some ideas that we can discuss maybe at uh, future meetings, if that's acceptable to everyone. Mr. Okay. Chair, I think that there was a motion to accept the tenants to homeowners request to pull their application. This is Sarah Waters, University of Kansas. So I think that was moved. I second that motion. Okay. <laughs> if we yes, could. I, thank you, Sarah. I did okay. hear that. And I was about to go there. Um, okay. so thank you. Uh, and uh, Thomas Howe made the uh, motion and Sarah Waters has 
uh, seconded that motion and we have it on our screens here. It says, accept the letter from tenants to homeowners for sending Lot Libertad Lawrence from this, uh, I think I would say this round of NOVA funding is what I would probably say. Um, to just add a little clarification. So with that on the floor, I would ask if there's any discussion or amendments to this motion. And you will have to speak up because with this on the screen, I can only see about three people. <laughs> so I see no further discussion. I am going to call the roll for a vote for approval. Um, Edith Guppy. Aye. Shannon Reed. Aye. Christina Gentry. Aye. Aye. Rebecca Buford. I will abstain just to show that there's no conflict, even though I'm requesting no funding. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Sarah Waters. Aye. Erica Zimmerman. Aye. Dana Ortiz. I ought to abstain as well because we're mentioned in the narrative of this doc of this project. Okay. Ron Gacious. Aye. Thomas Howe. Aye. Monty Sokup. Aye. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. Yes, two abstentions. Do you agree with me? Okay. Uh, motion passes. Thank you. All right. Now we are on to trying to figure out how what to fund now that uh, we now have four hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of funding available to us. Uh, so we would have some abstentions. So I see Rebecca has her hand up. Rebecca Beaver with Tennis to Homeowners. Monty or Diane, can you guys let us know how you want us? It, it, it would be okay then to just remove our video and our and mute ourselves, and then we can rejoin you because I think you may need us for a quorum, or do you not? Let me know what you what you need from us and how you want us to do that, please, because obviously I will abstain from this discussion. Yes, Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. Uh, we do need seven members um, uh, to have a quorum. Uh, so those seven have to be present at the beginning of the meeting, at the end of the meeting. If we dip down on one item because we don't have enough members that don't have a conflict, that is fine as long as we have um, at least seven at the beginning and seven at the end. So. Um, I think there'll be several um, several people who uh, need to recuse themselves, and so it would be good to um, determine exactly how many, and then uh, from there we can um, figure out how to proceed if if, uh, if we may need to ask uh, one or so of you to stay on just um, for the for the next part of the meeting. Um, and if you need to do that, um, as I mentioned, you could either leave the meeting and then come back in on Zoom, or you could just simply turn your video off and your audio off for that um, particular portion of the agenda. This is Monty Sokup Chair. Diane, I have a question. If, um, if the, I think we have three applicants. I think that'd be Dana, Erica, and Rebecca that I can see, um, unless I'm unaware of someone. Um, if they mute and close their video, if we had a question regarding one of their, can we reach out to them and ask them a question if they're invited to comment? Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager, and others may help me recall the details of the ethics policy but I believe that the ethics policy indicate that um, a, a member cannot uh, represent an item for which they have a conflict in front of the board that they're serving on. Uh, so with that, it would need to be someone else representing the application. 
Okay. Monty Sokup, thank you for that clarification. Um, so I guess I would ask Dana, Rebecca, and Erica uh, what your preference is um, as far as hanging on the meeting. We have one agenda item after, uh, actually a couple agenda items after this discussion, which I'd love to have your input on. Yeah, Dana. I'm, I'm fine with with staying on and it's good to, uh, I, I, I recuse myself and log on on the YouTube anyway, so it's just as easy. It's much easier actually to just mute and, and take my face off camera. Okay, thank you, Dana. Erica Zimmerman, Lawrence Habitat. I also recuse myself from this conversation, but I'll be jumping back on um, as I'm interested in our, our last um, meeting topic. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Erica. All right, Rebecca. Sorry, yeah, I recuse myself and I will, but I will join it, you guys again. Um, and I and I did wanna say, um, I believe Nicholas Ward is here for uh, from tenants to homeowners if you did have a question um, representing our organization. Monty Zucker Chair, thank you, Rebecca, appreciate that. And I did see Nicholas on earlier. Okay, so with our the three applicants accused, um, we need to essentially allocate the four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I believe, uh, across the remaining projects. Um, we had already made a recommendation uh, for, I believe, four of the projects. Two, three, one, two, three, four, five of the projects actually um, previously. So I think that might be a good place to start. Um, we also, uh, new information received a letter from uh, tenants to homeowners regarding the ARM project. Um, did everyone have it? If you, I guess if you didn't have a chance to read that, uh, that could be summarized. Uh, so I would open that up if they may not have a chance to read that. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> this, is, this is Danny Walters with um, Planning and Development Services. Um, another last minute um, addition to the agenda was a uh, chart that I had put together of some of the other funding applications that are happening right now with other programs and kind of what the status of some of those are. Um, I'd be happy to, to share that screen if, if people would like to see that. Um, I will say there's some, there's some information that actually hasn't been announced yet on there. So <laughs> um, we have been uh, tentatively awarded some emergency solutions grants funding. And uh, we just don't have the official notification from the state yet. So um, there, I definitely put on there that they are tentatively awarded. So um, I will I will share my screen just so everyone can can see this and let me know if you have any questions on it. Um, what I did was I tried to put kind of uh, like uh, projects on here that are, you know, consistent with, with what you're looking at application wise. And I have a, a question for clarification. This is uh, Edith Guthy, uh, member at large. Uh, Monty, you keep saying $450,000, but do we really have $450,000 to reallocate? Because we had allocated more than we actually had, is that correct? So, Edith, this is Monty Sokup Chair, my understanding of from the minutes is that we had allocated the $450,000 to the Libertad, yeah. right, which was our allocation. And then we recommended that the city, um, because we knew that that funding was not going to be needed for a while. We had recommended that the city distribute funding from the trust fund beginning in February for some of these other projects. 
So we were kind of dipping into more than the 450,000 that we had. And we, in the same breath, we asked the city to come up with other funding sources, which is essentially, I think, what Danny is trying to tell us about. <laughs> Uh, there may be some other funding sources. So, um, and you know, the committee had some angst at least over some of the projects that were requested that didn't really, uh, were, I guess were more emergency relief type things or COVID related type issues that were not really permanent affordable housing, but that we felt they were, strong enough proposals that we want to try to address those. So there's a whole lot of things mixed in here, but I think, and somebody from the staff, please correct me. I think we have $450,000 to allocate to whatever projects we see fit. And I think we should try to coordinate that with projects that might get funding from uh, this other source uh, so that they don't get double funded and we get the most, you know, we, we put our dollars to the work the best we can. Okay. I'm going to be quiet. I still have to ask another question. Okay. Uh, when the, when you say $450,000 to allocate, and that is assuming that those allocations we had made already, except to, uh, uh, Libertad are already funded or what? No. Monty Sogup chair. I think we have 450 total that would, you know, what would we say here? One, two, three, four, five, 250 of which has we recommended already. Thank you. That's what I, okay. We would have another 200,000 if I'm trying, if my math is right. Uh, I always hesitate. Your math, yeah. Math. Your math is right. <laughs> I hesitate to do math on uh, Zoom because it catches me every time. But um, so I think we have $200,000. But I think with the funding that's coming in from other sources, we need to look and see if some of these projects are funded in other ways. Is that right, Danny? Would you agree with that? Danny Walters, Planning and Development Sources. Yeah, we had a. Um for several projects that, that we're kind of looking at in the community, it's it's been requested to kind of see what the funding looks like overall for other types of funding sources. So this is kind of a living document that, that we've been keeping. And um, as I said, we were, we were just um, notified that um, we have received the emergency solutions grant awards that were still pending the last time we talked. So, um, those are really probably the most impactful ones. Um, we do have a, you know, a couple of home, um, home applications that you guys will discuss at your next meeting, but those are, are definitely just in the application received stages. But, um, yeah, so th this is, this is just kind of for your benefit to, to see what's out there and what's been funded from where. It's Monty Sogup Chair. Okay, Danny, I'm going to try to get my head around this. So I'm looking at our score sheet, and it has eight projects on it. So I'm going to read across those and ask you which ones have other funding sources, okay? Okay. So I can look at the, the remaining projects that don't have other funding sources. That's where I'm trying to get to. So I have Independence, Inc., Accessible Housing Program. Uh, there's no other, sorry, Danny Walters, no other funding source for. Okay. United Way, Douglas County, uh, Tennis to Homeowners, uh, Family Promise Housing Stabilization Collective, HSC. Uh, this is Danny Walters. The Housing Stabilization Collaborative was tentatively awarded $100,000 through the ESG CARES Act Round 2 funding. So they asked for 291 in their proposal and they've they have a hundred thousand in funding granted to them. The, yeah, their re Danny Walter, sorry, their request was a um, hundred thousand for the ESG grant. Okay. So. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, before you go, just on that particular one, this is Sarah Waters, University of Kansas. We had given them fifty thousand of that initial. So, if just so everybody's on the same page, we hadn't fully funded that. We had awarded fifty thousand of our kind of recommendation side. So. There's a there's a 
a delta there that we might want to consider making up is my point. Correct. Uh, Monty Sokup Chair. So Lawrence Douglas County Housing Authority, New Horizon. Danny Walters, Community Development. The, um, the New Horizons program is different than the voucher program that the Housing Authority is funded. Um, that said, they have an application in for home funding. Um, while it's different, it does do a lot of the, the same things, but we don't have anything that is, is um, awarded for that program. The awarded program for the housing authority that you see on here is for a landlord liaison who will be somebody that will be able to, to work with the housing authority and other agencies to connect folks looking for housing with available housing. So the award that you see on there is not a voucher program. Monty took up chair. So I get zero on that <laughs> from yes. other sources. I mean, pending. Well, correct. So there's, there's a pending application. Yes. Okay. Uh, Lawrence Community Shelter, Exiting Winter Shelter Housing Assistance. Danny Walters, Planning and Development. The um, Community Shelter was awarded, uh, looks like 170000 for rapid rehousing activities um, through the ESG grant. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence Habitat for Humanity, Critical Home Repair Workforce Housing. Danny Walters, Community Development. We do not have another pending application for Habitat. So that is zero. Go on to Soka, zero. Right? Correct. Correct. Okay, Burt Nash, CMHC, Transitional Housing. Danny Walters, Community Development. There is not actually a Burt Nash application that matches up with what they're requesting from your board. The, the money funded to Burt Nash is for, again, rapid rehousing. So moving people out of homelessness and into actual housing. So different than the application you received. Zero, Monty Sokup, zero. Yes. I, I'm really struggling putting Monty Sokup on the front of every sentence I start. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Tennis to homeowners, Libertad, zero, I'm assuming zero. Danny Walters, that is correct. And, and we have essentially removed that from our consideration. And finally, tenants to homeowners arm. Danny Walters, uh, there is not a comparable project to that one that has been. Okay, it's Monty Soka chair. So if you're keeping score, uh, it looks to me like Pending requests we have in front of us would be Independence Inc., um, a potentially a portion of the United Way Douglas County Housing Stabilization Program, uh, the New Horizons Project. It appears to me that the Lawrence Community Shelter received funding, so I would maybe pull that one. Uh, Lawrence Habitat for Humanity would be in front of us. Uh, Burt Nash would be in front of us. Uh, tenants to homeowners, Libertad, we would remove from consideration or have removed. And then tenants to homeowners, arm. This so. That, yeah. that does sound right. Um, I, you know, I would just add that for for some of these that are the of the assistance variety, so client assistance, housing, things like that. Um, the the amount of folks that they can help would be based on the amount of funding that they get. So, um, just to throw that out there. So. Certainly, certainly. Okay. Uh, Monty Sokup Chair, does, does everybody have kind of an understanding of where we stand at least with current funding that's been awarded through other projects? What's in front of us that really has not been awarded? Um, and does anybody have uh, opening comment? 
or thoughts on how to move forward? This is Sarah Waters, the University of Kansas. This uh, is a big dilemma. I'm so okay. sorry. Go ahead. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go ahead. I, and I can go ahead. To the gentry community, uh, community member at large. This is the dilemma, right? Um, how do we delegate uh, money to proposals that we have received? So my favorite idea is to open it to um, what we didn't select it as proposals. So if you were strongly wanting one proposal to move forward and giving it a five, maybe we open it up to the opportunity for the others um, who were ultimately unselected or got a, a lower number. Um, because I feel like this is an opportunity for us to move monies into our community that seem to me to be immediate responses to the effort of making affordable housing a, um, an effort that we, we move forward into. So, so I sat with this on New Year's Eve for quite a while. Um, I don't know if you guys did, but I did because it's my first time making proposals and making my um, making my proposal and making my um, making what I thought was going to be um, moving forward into the community in an effort that was going to make some payments and some efforts done with the Affordable Housing Advisory Trust. So. I would I would say that maybe we look at those proposals that we didn't look at uh, that had a strong following or, or a strong f number for us to decide on, and we continue to look at those proposals in a way that makes sense for our community. So that's that would be my idea, and how we move forward with what we should do with the extra money. That's Monty Sukup here. Thank you, Christina. I think Sarah, you had a comment. Yeah, Mr. Chair, actually, I'm going to, as Sarah Waters, University of Kansas, I'm going to make a recommendation that Lawrence Habitat, which we had previously said 50000 and isn't getting additional funding, we go ahead and move forward to fund, so the full request at 50000 I'm going to also say Independence Inc., which, again, $50,000 request. We had previously had $50,000, so to move that one forward as well. And... I'm going to move forward also the New Horizons, Lawrence Douglas County Housing Authority, because um, that was also 50000 So those three $50,000 projects, to go ahead and move those forward right now and say that $150,000 is allocated to those three. And then I think there is discussion some, uh, on the others um, and how we then take what is now left at 300000 If I do the math right, yes. $300,000 left to allocate amongst those that are there and, and perhaps we, um, Christina made a recommendation about how we might do that. And so, um, so but three would be funded, three off the table, $150,000 gone is what I'm requesting. This is Edith Guthy, uh, member at large. I would support that. Okay, so this is Monty Sokup, Chair. Um, can we get that in the form of a motion to approve those three? And then we will take the next step and look at the 300,000 we had to allocate. We don't need that part of the motion, just the motion to allocate. Thank you. Yeah, so Sarah Waters, University of Kansas, I move that we allocate Lawrence Habitat at $50,000, Independence Eek at $50,000, and Lawrence Douglas County Housing Authority New Horizons at $50,000 um, under this NOFA for this round. Thank you. Uh, Monty Sokup, Chair. Thank you, Sarah. Do we have a second? Edith Guffey, member at large, I second. Thank you, Edith Guffey, Monty Sokup, Chair. Um, is there any further discussion on the motion that's on the floor? Seeing none, I will take a roll call for the vote. Edith Guffey. Yes. Shannon Reed. Christina Gentry. Yes. Sarah Waters. Yes. Ron Gacious. Yes. Thomas Howe. Yes. Monty Sokup. Yes. That motion passes 7 0. Thank you. So, 
we now have $300,000 to allocate. And as I see it, the projects we have left are Burt Nash, uh, CMHC, Tenants to Homeowners, ARM, I'm going to flip my page, um, United Way, Douglas County, Tenants to Homeowners, HSC, and the Community Shelter, uh, Lawrence Community Shelter Project. So, those four projects. Does anyone have a suggestion? Christina, maybe uh, not to put you on the spot, but you seem to have put a lot of thought into this uh, and maybe have some ideas that maybe- I really, I kind of, I really did. I mean, this is my first go at it, right? And I really right. want to make a difference because I'd never done it before. And I understand that we have half our board um, that could weigh in and vote on it. So to me, it made a difference in the way I voted. Not ultimately because I was trying to make sure that we make a difference with these tax dollars, but also because we had so few people who had intelligence who could really recommend and really weigh in and get the questions that we need to have answered um, by the people who are presenting. So my question would be, um, as, it, as it pertains to the, the homeless shelter um, advocacy and, and the grant with, with Renee um, Cool, who was great in talking about how the monies were needed and necessary. What does that look like now as we are talking about home security and um, our home insecure population? Is that something that was um, recommended by another board? Did they get monies for that? I just, I just want to know what the standing issue is for some of the things that we were uh, able to observe in the applicants that wanted some uh, monies for their endeavors. I just want to know where they stand as of today. And I think we got a little bit of the understanding of that, but I, I kind of want a little bit more information. This is Danny Walters. I, I can try try to answer that. Are you I guess, can you, can you reframe the question just a, a bit for me? Are you just wanting to know? Absolutely. I mean, we're coming down to the last couple of dollars. Danny, I just want to know um, what needs to be funded that we haven't and what we, what can, we can do with the, um, the, the funds that we have available to make sure that they reach and make the impact that we want to make um, in affordable housing opportunities for our community. Um, I mean, I, I think that the Monty went through and, and had kind of marked the ones that were that, that were applications to this board that did not receive funding in other places. Um, I, you know, I think that my, my only point with the assistance ones that, that actually goes to client assistance that goes to rapid rehousing, um, those types of activities is that because it's not a, a a project cost per se, it's just the the more funding, the more people that can be helped. Um, I hate to simplify it like that, but that's that's just the math of it. That those those programs will happen. It's just that the impact um, kind of varies on on what your amounts are. Thomas, go ahead. Uh, Thomas Lawrence, Board of Realtors, would you give us those four? Would you review those four that did not get funded, the ones that are still left? Yes, I will review those four. <laughs> um, okay, we have Lawrence Community Shelter. They had asked for $50,000. Yep. Um, they did receive 170000 in other funding from the city. Right. Not that that, you know, okay. So uh, the second one is United Way, Douglas County, Tennis to Homeowners, Inc. Promise, Housing Stabilization. Yep. They asked for $291,400. They have received 100 from the city. Good. 
we had previously uh, recommended 50,000 for that project. Um, tenants to homeowners arm project. They requested $110,000. Uh, we had not made any award to that. Uh, and that's the one that the letter is written about. And I might just expand on that for a quick second. Um, I think a lot of the discussion in our last meeting was that that was a new program. And the letter basically outlined and said, look, this isn't a new program. It was a program that was funded previously uh, with CARES funding primarily. Uh, so it's not a new program. It's, it's a continuation of an existing program. Uh, program so and then uh burt nash cmhc transitional housing they requested four hundred ninety three thousand yep. dollars and we awarded them nothing in the last uh round yep. um although that project a couple rounds ago received funding from us to the tune of about four hundred and some thousand dollars i can't remember exactly and um, so, uh, any Diane Stoddard? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. Um, mm -hmm. And since you're talking about the next steps and kind of how to deliberate um, from from these from this point, um, just a reminder: um, the scores that were provided by the board um, were in your packet as well. Yep. And I do think that it's important for the board to be mindful of the kind of the ranking, if you will, of those projects related to those scores. Okay. Um, if, for example, if for example, the board wanted to do something that was out of sequence with the with the ranking, um, that could be possible. But I think that in your motion and in your discussion, um, if you would be clear as to why one project was selected over another, if that's the case. So there's been a lot here to digest, but I just wanted to uh, pass that along. I know that's been something that the city commission has been interested in. You know, if, if for some reason you you um, um, make a decision for funding that, that doesn't quite match up with how that ranking went on the scores. Understood. Um, this is Edith Guffey, member at large. And um, I, I'd like to say that I am not really enthusiastic about funding Burt Nash. I think Burt Nash is a wonderful program. I think what they've done is great. But as I recall, this came as a, uh, like cost overruns. Is this kind of accurate? And um, this, not, I wasn't on the board when you gave money in the first place, but I'm not interested in funding a project that had cost overruns when we could have money that goes directly for services at this point. I'd like to make a proposal. Uh, hold on, uh, Thomas, just give me a second. Ron uh, had his hand up yep. there. I think he has a comment. Ron Gacious, Chamber Representative. I was only going to second Edith's comment. Um, we did help fund that Birth Nash project, a very impressive project. If you haven't been by, you should go. It's, it's a fabulous facility. Uh, but the request is to make them whole on cost overruns. And as, as much as I like the project, I don't think we should set the precedent of being a place to go to address your cost overruns. Um, so I, I would uh, concur with Edith that I would still prefer that we distribute dollars elsewhere. Uh, Monty Sokup Chair, thank you, Ron. Uh, let's, uh, Thomas, uh, I wanted to make a proposal, I think, actually. That, that's correct. My, my understanding is we have $300,000 left to allocate at this point. Is that correct? That so is correct. I, I, I would move that we uh, allocate $50,000 to the Lawrence Community Shelter, that we allocate $150,000 to the United Way Douglas County a tenant to homeowner project, and that we allocate $100,000 to the tenants to homeowners ARM. Christina Gentry, citizen at large. I would recommend uh, that as a governing body with the funds that we have available, that we look into creative ways to spend the money. 
I don't, I don't know because it's my first time going around with the funds and the opportunities for grant for grants. Do we need to spend the three hundred thousand dollars if we don't find it to be an opportunity that would make a sense for affordable housing opportunities in our community? This is Monty Sokup Chair. Um, I don't believe we have to spend that. Uh, certainly, it would be available in the next round of funding, so we might have a little bit more in the next round of funding. Um, I think this is a weird time, as everybody knows, that we have multiple outside, you know, federal funding sources available. They're picking up some of this, like, we don't normally have this. Um, so it might, you know, I agree, we should spend the money on projects that make sense and gain us ground. And if we uh, don't feel like we need to spend all the money, then we should I think we, it's our job to be good stewards of that, those funds. Mr. Chair, this is Sarah Waters, University of Kansas. I, I think we have projects worthy of spending this money on and to allocating um, based on our scoring matrix. And so um, I, and so I do agree with Thomas's proposal. I know it's a motion. I don't know if we wanna have further discussion. Um, and so, but I do think we have $300,000 worth of projects left to allocate this money to. Okay. So uh, go ahead, Edith. I, I saw Ron's hand. Okay, I'll go ahead. Uh, I'd like All I was going to do was second, Ron Gage's chamber representative, all I was going to do was second Tom's motion so that we've got something on the table to consider. Okay. Um, I'd like for you to convince me about ARM. Uh, so tell me why my thinking is off, because it surely must be. Um, it, it feels to me that we are uh, upgrading property that is privately owned of landlords who have not done that. And so they will promise only five years it'll be affordable and then they can do what they want. So we're, it feels like we're rewarding uh, land, private landlords for not keeping their property up to date. So I'm, I'm sure that's a wrong way to see it. <laughs> so. No, I don't think it's a wrong way. This is Christina Gentry, citizen at large. I don't think it's a wrong way to see it. We had the scoring matrix that we use, and I think we scored it in a way that made sense to us individually. I just want us to acknowledge the fact that we started our conversation on talking about addressing ways to source those that make income in a way that's not the dominant, that we're trying to make accessible, equitable opportunities for our community. We have $300,000 that could move in this in a space that we're trying to address in this, in this space um, of our agenda. So I want us to I would want us to, if we weren't moved by the first opportunity for us to vote uh, strongly for the opportunity to move the, the funds um, in a way that now as we look at our second opportunity to look at how we can allocate those funds, that we do stick to our agenda items that have been as a result of us understanding our community at a base level. And we move to make those opportunities available to our community that eliminate income or uh what is it hold on just a minute we are designing an income strategic income that makes sure that we are looking at accepting applications that deal with uh, the barriers that exist for people who are trying to allocate or get those funds that we have available for at our discretion to make uh votes yes or no to i'm hoping i'm making sense now um but I absolutely think that this is a prime opportunity for us to think about creative ways to, to use the monies that we have right now to make uh, affordable housing in, in a way that's accessible that wasn't before. Um, before, and I mean not before because we weren't doing the work, before because we didn't know what the work looked like. So there, there, that's, that's my interjection. Mr. Chair, Sarah Waters, University of Kansas, could Nicholas Ward perhaps, I believe he's on the call and it would be appropriate to ask him, I think, to address Edith's question um, and Edith's concern. Um, we can do that, right? Because- Auntie Sokup, Chair, yes, okay. we can. 
Nicholas, yeah, I just, I think Nicholas, there. yeah, there he is, being able to bring that to life and to explain some of those concerns that Edith is voicing about that proposal. Edith, does that sound reasonable? Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Edith, for the question. And then also, Christina, for some of the concerns that you're posting as well. I tried to address some of this in the letter, but I, one of the things that we're running up against is, you know, in the end, we're not generating enough affordable housing in the community for the need that's present. And so part of our charge is to come up with new um, inventive ways to utilize resources that are currently under-recognized or underutilized. And so one of the things that we've come up with um, is looking around in our community at houses that are sitting vacant, uh, but could serve as affordable housing to find a way with a minimal amount of uh, kind of financial uplift for those properties to make them suitable and available for folks who are seeking out affordable rentals. Right now for tenants to homeowners, um, we have plenty of people looking for affordable rental housing. We have no vacant rental properties to offer any of those people. And so um, if we're building a house that's permanently affordable, um, but if we're building a house, we're infusing 110, 120 with uh, construction costs the way they are right now, maybe 130,000 into that single property. Our goal for ARM would be that we infuse $5,000 into a property and that for three to five years, uh, that's, per that's affordable for the person who would be um, renting that space, $300 a month under fair market rent. Um, and then our, one of our goals would be because we've now had three to five years of experience with that physical property, that house, that we've had enough experience with it to where we can be fundraising during that time to go through and purchase the house um, at the end of that three or five year contract. And that way we're sure that the house we're getting won't need $50,000 in repairs um, because we've had enough experience with the foundation, with systems, understanding uh, energy costs, what kind of green upgrades need to be made to the home, understanding the property where it's located and if there's any drainage issues. Um, so this is really, it's a model for us to kind of court a house before we put it into permanent affordability. And um, there's, you know, I wasn't able to write all the contractual stuff into the, the document that I sent, but essentially if someone were to try to pull a house out of the ARM program early on, they're prorated, at a prorated amount, they're paying back the ARM program if they want to sell the house or do anything else. Um, if we go through and make an agreement to purchase um, the house before the contract is over, we're deducting the amount that we infused in it initially from what the purchase price would be. So there are multiple ways where we're not losing the subsidy in it, and it's allowing us to make an educated and informed decision about how we acquire um, homes that would need to be rehabilitated on some level. And it's also um, just from the work that I've been doing in outreach and touching base with folks who are owning these properties, this is a really great way for us to get scattered sites throughout the community um, because we're finding these houses, um, you know, less on the far west side, but all over the place. Um, we're finding these houses that for one reason, reason or another have been sitting vacant for a while. Um, and the reasons are wide. There's a lot of reasons why people are sitting on houses that I wasn't aware of previous to doing work on this program, but, um, that's kind of where we're sitting. Edith, if you have something more specific that you just want me to answer like straight up and you need an exact answer on it, just let me know. Um, but I'll, I'll stop there and then uh, please feel free to offer any other questions. Thank you. Sponsor so Circuit Chair, Ron, you've got a question. Ron Gacious, Chamber Representative. Um, I wanted to add to this particular discussion that when we met in January, my head on this issue was com completely and totally where Edith is right now. I had an opportunity in the four weeks since that meeting to have a couple of discussions with uh, one local developer and one, de and one um, uh, property investor who doesn't happen to have anything in Lawrence, but does in a couple of smaller communities in our county, as well as Leavenworth County. And 
and I've, I've asked them about this question of upkeep. One of them actually referred me to, back to our own housing study that indicated the high percentage of properties that renters self uh, uh, that renters describe as being substandard and also uh, referred me to the large number of properties that were losing in the affordable housing category, not because they're being torn down necessarily, but simply because the rents are being raised on those older properties as modifications are being made by the landlord. And so the landlords are looking for a way to recover those, those expenses and they're increasing their rents. Um, I've since decided that this is a pretty good targeted way to go in and, and get a modest improvement done in those homes, uh, anticipating that Nick and his team are not going to put money into places where there's no chance of uh, salvaging the property long term. Uh, I, I can now support this funding uh, for this program, where a month ago I was much more hesitant to agree to this model. I think that there is a significant need to upgrade some properties, uh, particularly for those that might have disabilities or accessibility uh, needs and or simply for weatherization. And, and uh, this, I think, it, it, it won't touch a lot of properties because it takes a lot of money each property to make the improvements. But, but it's the kind of thing that we need to be doing in addition to creating new permanently affordable housing opportunities. Uh, thank you, Ron. This is Monty Sogup Chair. Um, I kind of, I, I, I guess I was kind of in the same place um, when we looked at this in January and the more I've thought about it and uh, a little bit listening to Christina's comments, um, if these houses are, you know, close to the affordable range and we are improving the housing stock, even if it's just for five years, for the people that would experience living in those houses. So we're improving the human experience um, of the affordable housing stock in Lawrence. Um, I don't think $5,000 uh, a house is terrible. It's certainly cheaper than a voucher program for the same period. Um, so those, to me, I was looking at the human aspect side of that, um, which made me kind of tilt towards this project. What I would like to see in this project, and I don't know if, you know, if this is possible, but if we could get for that $5,000, a actual first right of offer um, on those homes, if we put that money in there and we can get a first right of offer to purchase the home when it does come available, it doesn't, you know, uh, that we have the opportunity, we're, we're essentially buying an opportunity to put that into a per permanent affordable uh, in the future. I think that is essentially going upstream and uh, keeping the babies from coming down the river, uh, in, in my opinion, if we can do that. So I see uh, <laughs> Nicholas has his hand up. I'm gonna let Nicholas comment and then I see you, Thomas, and we'll get to you. Thanks for that, Monty. So that's something early on that we um, pre-built into our contract is that um, for making, you know, we need something for making these improvements. Uh, so tenants to homeowners under a contract signed with the owner has first right of refusal for purchase of the property during um, the span of time that the property is under contract with the ARM program. Uh, this is Monty Sogup Chair. I'm gonna just comment on that. I think it should be longer than the five years. I think you should try to get a permanent first right of offer, not first right of refusal, because the first right of refusal is gonna, that's a different vehicle than the offer. Um, a little less flex, a little less obtrusive for the seller. I think you'll have a better chance of getting that. So then I'm going to stop there. I think Thomas had his hand up next. I, I did not have my hand up. It was just oh, your comment of the, 
of stopping the babies coming down the river. I was unclear on where those, what river that was and which babies we were talking about. Um, well, uh, sorry, that's a biblical story. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not gonna dive into that here, um, but I'll, I'll get with you later, Thomas. <laughs> Uh, any other comments? If we don't have a lot of comments, I'd like to get the motion up on the screen for us to all see. Um, and then we'll have more comments, I think. Do we have that? Thanks. So I have some questions about, this is Christina, citizen at large. Christina Gentry, citizen at large. I have some questions about those. Those homes and where those homes will be uh, located in our Lawrence Douglas County. Uh, I just I I want more information about what that looks like uh, because we know that the educational and economic benefits for families uh, that move from high poverty to low poverty neighborhoods benefit in the high poverty or no I'm sorry benefit in the low poverty um, in a way. All right, let me, let me start over. The, the benefits in the opportunities for folks to live in places that have opportunities uh, like the closeness and the proximity to a good school, um, whether, whether it be public school, but we know that the 6044 area code is not where we want to concentrate our efforts because we just understand as a community, that's not where we want our uh, folks to live and, and then also to continue living when it comes to a house and it comes to opportunities for their, their family to recover for any income insecurities that they, they are um, experiencing. So I would want more information about what these, uh, where these homes are going to be located. And, and I'm hearing that there's not a lot of opportunity to understand what um, the proposals look like because it's really, a, 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 to me, it's a misunderstanding, probably most likely a misunderstanding of where these homes are going to be that we are talking about um, trying to finance and make ready for, for tenants. Um, I really want us to, to concentrate on trying to move more opportunities for vouchers or systems that put homes in places that are not concentrated in poverty that we know that, that exist in Lawrence. Um, and so I, I really, for, for me morally, I, just, I want more information about what this, the tenants to homeowners um, grant would do to get those homes that are not located in, in a saturation of, of poverty that we know that exists in Lawrence. Um, and I just kind of want to know where those homes would be and what we are trying to support, because I absolutely want to support an opportunity for people to um, have affordable housing, but I just don't want it to make itself to be a barrier and create more of the um, opportunities that we're trying to, to eliminate. Um, if that makes sense to anyone, please chime in um, with what we're trying to create with the opportunity to make sure that we have grant funds to move into these spaces. Okay, this is Monty Soka, Chair. Um, do we have any further discussion? Uh, Christina, thank you for those comments. I certainly agree. I think we all agree, at least I hope we do, that we're, we need to develop affordable housing in non, in, in the, whether you call it the Western half of the city or areas that have a little bit lower, lower poverty, uh, I think we're all in agreement that we need to, you know, we're trying to move that direction. And certainly we can provide that direction to tenants, the homeowners with the arm project that they concentrate on um, houses in, uh, I, I don't know how to say this, 
correctly, but uh, areas that have less poverty, you know, more affluent uh, areas of the city to divert this first the housing, you know, throughout the community. I mean, that's the, that's one of the I think tenants that we have is to disperse the affordable housing throughout the entire community, and maybe that's the best way to to get at that. Um, so certainly, we could provide that direction uh, with our grant. Uh, I think they're headed probably headed that direction anyway, but. Do we have further comments on the motion that's on the table? We have a motion and a second. Shannon, I think you're raising your hand. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, Chair Shannon Reed here, Douglas County Commissioner. Um, Chair, I apologize to everybody else. I um, did not calculate for more than 90 minutes for this meeting, and I do have to leave because of another commitment. So this discussion has been really great, and I'll look forward to catching up on the rest of it later. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge that, that I do have to leave early. I mentioned that to Diane in a chat, um, and hopefully that will not impact quorum and ability to, to vote. So my apologies, everybody. Uh, Monty Sokup, Chair, could you stay for two minutes? Because we may be able to take a vote on this issue. Sure, I can do that. OK. Um, I'd like to call a vote on this current proposal. OK, I'm going to. Mr. Chair, Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. Just a quick question. Um, I think that I caught that Thomas Howe had made the motion, but is uh, who made the second? I'm sorry. Oh, Mr. Green. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I am going to call the vote on the current motion. Uh, Edith. Uh, yes. Shannon Reed. Yes. Christina Gentry. Could you repeat the motion, please? Yeah, uh, Danny, can you put that up on the screen? This is Danny. Um, Jeff has it, so I would ask yeah. if you could put it back up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the current motion is to allocate the remaining $300,000 funds of this NOFA to Lawrence Community Shelter for 50,000, United Way Douglas County Family Promise of Lawrence Tennis to Homeowners 150,000, and Tennis to Homeowners Arm 100,000. Uh, I, I would I would say nay. No, okay. Uh, Sarah Waters. Yes. Ron Gacious? Yes. Thomas Howe? Yes. Uh, Monty Sokup? Yes. So that is six yes, one no. That motion passes. Okay, thank you, that's Monty Sokup Chair. Thank you, Shannon, for sticking around for that. Um, and with that, I would just ask that uh, tenants to homeowners certainly be uh, highly cognitive of the fact that we are looking for homes in uh, dispersed throughout the entire community uh, with as much as possible, you know, obviously getting the highest quality homes in the best neighborhoods we can uh, potentially acquire. I realize these come up on the market. We don't always have control of that, those locations, but to the extent we do, uh, we should be trying to get them in the best neighborhoods we possibly can. Okay, um, we have uh, receive and consider approving the 2020 AHAB annual report. Uh, the report was posted. Um, I thought it looked very nice uh, and did a nice job of summarizing uh, what we've done and where we're trying to go. And I think we should call back also uh, Dana and Re Erica and Rebecca could come back to the meeting at this point. <sighs> Sorry if you weren't uh, listening. We're uh, looking at the 2020 annual report. I ask if there are 
any comments? I note that we are nearing one o'clock and most of us probably allocated a couple hours for this. So um, look for any comments on the annual report. I would concur with your assessment. I thought it looked very good. Okay, do we uh, need a motion to approve the report as written, Diane? Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. Yes, Mr. Chair, that would be helpful. And then this report we will forward on to the City Commission um, on your behalf. Okay, so I would look for a, a motion to approve the report as written and to forward it to the City Commission. Ron Gacious, Chamber Representative. Uh, so moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ron. Do we have a second for that motion? Second. Rebecca Buford, tenants to homeowners. Rebecca Buford, seconded. Is there any discussion regarding the report? Seeing none, I will call the roll uh, for that motion. Uh, Edith Guffey? Yes. Shannon, does Shannon leave us? Okay. Christina Gentry? Yes. Rebecca Buford? Yes. Sarah Waters? Yes. Erica Zimmerman? Yes. Dana Ortiz? Yes. Ron Gacious? Ron? Yes. Okay. Thomas Howe? Aye. Monty Sokup? Aye. Motion passes 9 zero okay uh discuss size and makeup of the board item six so, um, i think that falls into uh, monty soak up chair i think that falls into this discussion that came up earlier about having our some of our key uh players in um, in the affordable housing game, not able to participate in a large part of the discussion because they're making uh, recommendations or making applications. So uh, are there comments on that? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, Ron Gacious, Chamber Representative. Mm -hmm. um, my, I, I have an interest in seeing um, the board increased in size, but just slightly. And my the, the problem I, I would like to address by increasing the board by two members is that issue when, when we have to excuse board members because they have conflicts of interest, they are repre representing uh, agencies or organizations that have proposals before us. It puts us in a really tight spot of being able to um, have a quorum and a sufficient uh, number of opinions to have a full discussion with just those of us that are remaining. I think that if we were to increase the size of the advisory board by two from the current 13 to 15, then when we lost four or five of our members as a result of conflicts of interest, we would still have maybe eight or nine or 10 of us left to discuss the projects. And I think that would be uh, an opportunity for uh, increased diversity of opinion and adding a couple of additional board members might provide us an opportunity to add more diversity to the Affordable Housing Advisory Board as well. Um, so I'm, I'm not trying to make a recommendation at this time. I just like to participate in the discussion. And it's for that reason that I think there could be some merit in increasing the advisory board by, by one or two folks. Thank you. That's uh, here, Ron, thank you for those comments. Did somebody else have a comment? Uh, this is yeah. Edith. Uh, Edith Guffey, member at large. And I, I want to 
ask a, a different question that um, is not a, a personal question about anyone currently serving on the board. I just want to say that flat out. Um, I wonder about uh, what may appear as insiders, outsiders. Um, I, I understand the importance of having uh, the experts because you have so much information that is helpful. Um, on the other hand, it does give your organizations an inside track. And I wonder about that. Uh, it gives an inside track, perhaps unintentionally. Um, it wasn't intentional, but intent, intent and impact are both very different. And so I just wonder about that question and have we thought about that question? And again, I wanna say that is not a question that devalues any of you personally or the work that you have done or the contribution you've made. It's, it's a bigger kind of question. Monty Sokup, Chair. Uh, Edith, I had the, the same kind of thought, but wondered about what our structure maybe could look like. And I don't know that we have time today to explore this, but I almost wondered if our uh, four uh, not-for-profit organizations could be advisory to this board instead of being on the board, then they would not have to recuse themselves from submittals. They wouldn't be voting on anything. They wouldn't have a conflict because they would be simply advisory to the board. Um, obviously, I have not discussed that with them or Diane <laughs> or anyone, but I'm just trying to think about ways to get around the same issue that we're all having, I think, with um, when we have these tough discussions the people that really know the field have to be, are not present. And um, I think we're losing, I agree, we're losing something in that. So, but I also, you know, value them being on the board, but I don't know which is more valuable. So I'm, I, uh, yeah, Dana Ortiz, go ahead. Dana Ortiz, Family Promise of Lawrence, and thanks for having the courage to raise the question, Edith. I appreciate it. And there's numerous times when I've been listening in a recused mode where there's questions of, are these similar? Are they, you know, and I just have the answer and I can't say it. And and so, yeah, there's there's got to be a better way where we can take advantage um, of some of the questions that are raised and they're great questions um, and there's an answer or there's a perspective that I think Shannon Ari and Erica and Rebecca and I could give from that, but we're unable to. So I think we're hampering in some ways our education of our advisory board by not utilizing those opportunities. Unfortunately, those questions only come up, it seems like, or frequently come up when we're looking at funding requests. Um, and, and it's an odd position to sit in as a potential recipient to answer a question that might be perceived as trying to up our project or, you know, it, it's, it's, it's set up rather dicey. This is Monty Sokup, Chair. I think uh, I, I think we need to think about this and think about what the options might be. Uh, that might be an internal discussion for Diane and her staff, and what maybe our options are, and uh, or what kind of structures how we can change. But I think we need to do that a little bit of research before we do much. I think we've identified the problem don't have enough material to, to have it come up with some kind of solution today. So I'm gonna ask maybe we defer this for another meeting, give us some time to think about uh, those structures. If anyone has on the board has ideas, certainly forward them to Diane. Sorry, Diane. <laughs> and uh, um, we'll try to come up with some ideas that we can react to and see if we think that works in the future. Does that sound like a reasonable plan? Uh, Dana, I see your hand up. Yeah, uh, I think it's also important to defer it for now away from the funding decisions too, because though that's when the catalyst happens that we're we're feeling awkward about it, it's bigger. It's bigger than that. It's uh, it's about education. It's about housing expertise and things like that. And I think deferring it away from a funding decision would be very wise. Okay, uh, Erica Zimmerman. 
that are on Lauren's habitat. This just raises a question for me, Diane. Where are we on the housing uh, coordinator position for the city? Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. Um, we are in the process of conducting interviews at this point and hope to have a decision sometime here in the near future. Monty Soak up Chair, uh, Diane is near future before our April 12th meeting, do you think? I know you can't answer solid, but. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, April meeting or March meeting? Were you saying March, April? I'm sorry, March. Okay. Um, yeah, that it's it's a it's a little unclear to know, especially whether um, you know if an offer is extended, it usually takes somebody a period of time to get on board, et cetera. So I don't know that I can answer that here today. Okay, thank you, Diane Monty. So good. Okay, so moving on, uh, other new business. We received a request from the Planning Commission for a joint study session for the, at the April twelfth meeting. Um, I'm in favor of meeting with them. I would uh, probably need to look at the agenda and, and schedule the appropriate amount of time to meet with them um, so that we have other business to take care of. Um, our, our meetings seem to go long all the time. So uh, I don't know, is an hour appropriate to meet with them, do you think? Diane, I guess I'm asking. Diane Sautter, Assistant City Manager. I might ask um, if Jeff might be co uh, able to comment on this item because he he participated in the discussion where the Planning Commission was um, was extending the interest in the joint meeting. Mm -hmm. Jeff Craig, Planning and Development Services Director. Uh, typically, the, the meetings can be anywhere between 60 to 90 minutes. They've held joint meetings with uh, Multimodal Transportation Commission and some other boards. Uh, they wanted to continue the, the meeting that we had um, about over a year ago now, just about a couple of months over that. They wanted to keep that rolling. We got a little bit off track due to COVID, and they would just like to kind of extend that offer to come to you and, and continue that dialogue. Okay, I, I think it's, like I said, I think it's a great idea. Um, I just, uh, I want to make sure that we have time to do our business as well on April 12th. That's our meeting date, is correct? And because uh, we have plenty on our plate, so if we could maybe make that an hour long discussion and then we have an hour our business that we're gonna have in April and have some of these other discussions uh, as we feel our way along, <laughs> um, that'd be great. Do we need a motion or anything on that or is that just accepting the, their invitation? Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. I don't know that we need a motion if if everyone's um, in concurrence generally with um, um, having uh, that discussion with them. We could certainly allocate some time for your April meeting. I think they just wanted to know in advance uh, for preparation purposes. Okay. Uh, Monty Sokup, Chair. Thank you, Diane. Is anybody object to having that meeting with them? Seeing no objections, uh, please let them know. We'll accept their invitation. Um, I think that leaves us uh, to the calendar. Hold on, Ron. Is there any other new business? Ron Gacious? Um, if you'll ask for old business, I'll comment on old business. <laughs> okay. Not on the agenda. Not on the agenda, Ron. You're throwing me a curveball here. Um, go ahead, Ron. Old business. Ron Gacious, Chamber Representative. I participated in the Planning Commission meeting um, this past month. That was in late January, where they took up consideration of the three code changes we made back in August regarding the cost of new housing. Um, I might note that staff recommended against approval of all three of our proposed changes. Uh, staff had worked with the Home Builders Association and made an alternative recommendation regarding um, tree requirements for new construction. They left in place the requirement of a tree every 40 foot 
and instead they agreed to look at reducing the diameter, the size of the tree. Um, there was a lot of interest in the Planning Commission um, in uh, asking the City Commission to kind of take a new bite at the apple, my phrase, not, I think, reflected in the minutes, but to try again to have a, a study or some type of task force that would look at how could you possibly reduce the cost of new housing by 5%. Planning Commission thought that we were dealing with, uh, I think their comments were that we were dealing with insignificant cost items and that there's no way we could approach the 5% uh, reduction in cost of new housing with the kinds of issues that we were discussing at the time. And uh, I, think they, I think there are some Planning Commission meeting, uh, members who would like to spend part of the time in April visiting with us talking about that issue. Thank you. Monty Sokup, Chair. Ron, thank you for attending that meeting and bringing that report to us. Uh, not sure how to comment on that, but uh, certainly we would be open to uh, talking with them further about uh, how to reduce uh, new housing costs and realizing that maybe we were attacking the wrong uh, wrong things uh, or the scope of what we were doing wasn't bold enough. So um, thank you. I guess the next thing on the uh, agenda is the calendar, unless there are any other comments on uh, Ron's report. So Monty Sokup Chair, on the calendar, we had the March 8th meeting with the review of the 2021 home applications and making funding re recommendations on those. And the next two meetings are April 12th and May 10th. Any questions on that? Okay, if not, I will take a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved, Edith Guffey. And a second. Thomas Howe, second. All right. Any comments on any questions or discussion on that? Okay. Uh, Edith Guffey. Yes. Christina Gentry. Christina Gentry. I think, I think she's she disappeared. Okay. Uh, Rebecca Buford. Yes. Sarah Waters. Yes. Erica Zimmerman. Yes. Dana Ortiz. Yes. Ron Gacious. Yes. Thomas Howe. Yep. Monty Sokup. Yay. Motion passes 8 0. Bye bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.